Donc, euh, mon nom est Claude Trépanier de la Nouvelle Cartier, un comité soutenu par euh, le comité des citoyens et citoyennes de Milton Park, euh, un ensemble de coopératives d'habitation dans le centre-ville de Montréal. Donc, euh, ce soir, c'est un événement parmi une série de huit événements depuis le 3 novembre dernier. Et le 3 novembre dernier, ben, j'étais un participant et euh, j'ai été en allée. Et je suis devenu bénévole. Euh, donc, euh, ce soir, nous allons avoir une conférence euh, de John Davis de Burlington au Vermont. Et John a une euh, expérience de près de 40 ans dans la création de plus d'une centaine de fiducies foncières communautaires. Il est maintenant euh, consultant pour aider à créer des fiducies foncières communautaires. Mais avant de passer à la conférence de John, j'aimerais vous présenter Dimitri Rousseau-Poulos, un des fondateurs de la communauté de Milton Park. C'est à la fois somme à les moments qui ne sont pas du tout propices. Ça m'arrive assez souvent. Écoutez, je vous souhaite, mes concitoyens, concitoyennes, un accueil et bienvenue chaleureux. Et j'ai deux choses à vous annoncer qui sont extrêmement importantes. D'abord, ma conférence qui est prévue pour le mois d'avril. Il y a des clients dehors, prenez en masse parce qu'on va être très heureux et on va être très créatif au Centre canadien d'architecture. Alors vous êtes tous bienvenus. Il y a beaucoup à prendre, il y a beaucoup à discuter ensemble, il y a beaucoup à planifier pour l'avenir. Mais mon deuxième annonce euh, est au sujet d'un livre qui vient d'être publié il y a quelques semaines. Et c'est un livre en anglais. Euh, et j'espère que nos camarades dans les éditions Éco-Société, on va le traduire et publier en français. Mais entre-temps, je vais vous dire quelques mots à ce sujet-là. The book is called Villages in Cities. Villages in Cities. The subtitle is Community Land Ownership, Cooperative Housing, and the Milton Park Story. So if you want to know Milton Park story. If you want to read uh, a lot of excellent documentation in it, this is the book to buy, and it is available here tonight to all you good people at a discount. And in addition to the discount, I will be sitting outside, and since I am a co-editor of this extremely important book, I'll be happy to sign it for you, even dedicated to you. So, seize the moment <laughs> and have a good conference. Bonjour, je serai très courte. Bienvenue à la Maison du Développement Durable. Je m'appelle Ariane. On est extrêmement heureux de recevoir le réputé John Davis qui va nous parler de la fiducie foncière euh, et aussi Marie-Sophie Borville qui va replacer tout ça dans le contexte québécois. La Maison du Développement Durable a été fondée par huit organisations engagées dans la promotion du développement durable. C'est aussi le siège social d'une vingtaine de groupes qui œuvrent pour l'environnement et la justice sociale. Cette mise en commun des ressources crée une synergie qui permet de faire de la maison un carrefour d'innovation sociale. La Maison du Développement Durable est aussi une propriété collective. Si son, si son modèle d'affaires vous intéresse, nous vous invitons à venir assister à la conférence que nous ferons dans le cadre du colloque à nouvelle quartier au Centre canadien de l'architecture à la mi-avril. Bonne conférence. Il y a des gens dans la salle qui aimeraient avoir de la traduction sur le chuchoter. Levez la main. Oui, c'est des fois en arrière. D'accord, merci. Donc, euh, bonne conférence. Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> well, good evening. Um, I have to apologize for all of you who uh, only speak French. I am a monolingual American, like many of my fellow countrymen and countrywomen, so I apologize for that. That's just sort of what we do down there <laughs> on the other side of North America. Uh, let me ask, 
how many folks here in the room already have some familiarity with community land trust? You see here, ah, oh, good, good, good. How many of you have ever lived on a community land trust? Ah, there we go, we have several. And how many are associated with the Milton Park Cooperative? So you're very familiar with this too, yes? I'm down in Burlington, Vermont, where we've had a community land trust uh, since 1984. It was started uh, under the initiative of Bernie Sanders when he was the mayor of the city of Burlington. And our first housing that we did with our community land trust was single family detached houses. And then we did some duplexes. And then we did some condominiums. But we realized that we weren't able to reach far enough down the income ladder to really provide housing for all the people we were trying to provide housing for. So we said, you know, we really need to learn about cooperatives. And the place we went to learn about cooperatives was Milton Park. And we learned from you, we brought those lessons back, and now we have about eight uh, limited equity cooperatives in our community land trust in Burlington. But it was seeded, it was inspired by the work of you folks here in Montreal with Milton Park. So, thank you. I think you're going to see with the, you know, the talk I'm gonna give and the film you're going to see that we all steal from each other, right? I, once in a while, I've been asked to uh, impersonate a professor on a college campus teaching city and regional planning. And you know, we go through all the techniques and all the maps and the, you know, the GIS and all of that. And somewhere along the line, my students always say to me, all right, John, you're doing a pretty good job impersonating an academic. <laughs> but we know that you're really a practitioner in disguise. We want to become city planners. What do we need to learn, really, to become a successful city planner? And I lean forward like I'm imparting this great wisdom, and I say, planning is theft. <laughs> Go out there and steal the best ideas you can Shit. from the people who are already doing it, who have already made the mistakes, and then bring them home. That's what we did in Burlington with the cooperative, and I hope that you steal some of these ideas tonight. You should. But you're going to take them and make them your own, yes? We'll share. We'll share them. It's, it's planning is theft, or maybe it's planning is sharing. Okay, good enough. <laughs> so here are some of the things I'm going to try to cover tonight. Um, we have a lot to cover a lot of history to cover. We may not get to all of it, but in the ideal world, I would start out by making sure that we all have the same vocabulary and we know what a community land trust is. I would also like to introduce you to some of the pioneers, some of the people whose shoulders we stand on because we all borrow ideas, we share ideas. And then, if we've got any time at the end, and I want to make sure that we have time for your questions, and also because we do have some uh, community land trust practitioners here in the room, I want to make sure that, it, that they have an opportunity to tell you about the great work that they're doing. We may not get to the last one, but if we do, I'm going to tell you some of the things that I think we did right in the USA in building a community land trust movement, but also I'm going to confess to some of the things that I think we're doing wrong today. We're not completely so arrogant that we still believe that everything we're doing is wonderful. <laughs> there are now about 250 to 280 community land trusts in the United States, including a part of the United States that many people in the mainland forget is part of the United States because it's one of our colonies, and that's Puerto Rico. And there is a wonderful community land trust in San Juan mm -hmm. called the Cano Martin Pena CLT. The model has jumped the oceans so that there are now community land trusts in England and in Belgium, Australia, France, and a fledgling CLT movement here in Canada. 
England now has about 200 community land trusts. Belgium, three. France, the first one is in Lille. I was there in May of last year. So the French are just now starting to adopt the model. And I understand there are about 20 uh, community land trusts in various forms, stages of development here in Canada. So the ideas that we borrowed from other people are now being borrowed from the CLTs in the mainland and, the, and Puerto Rico. For the first time in 2016, community land trusts were mentioned in an official document of the United Nations at the <coughs> Quito conference in Ecuador. It all started, or at least the first modern CLT that we point back to as the first CLT, it started with new communities in 1969 in southwest Georgia. It came out of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. And we're going to see a film because I think it's important for us to understand that this model emerged out of a history of a struggle for social justice. It wasn't something handed down from academia. So, community land trust in the United States, and that's where I'm going to focus, come in many different forms. In fact, many of the CLTs don't even call themselves community land trust. They come up with some other fancy names, proud ground, red brick. Um, so there's a lot of diversity. Community land trusts are not like McDonald's or Kentucky, Fran you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises where every community land trust looks alike. A lot of variations. But I'm going to try to sort through all of those variations and give you a sense of kind of the core features of what we think of in the US as the classic CLT with the acknowledgement that every local community land trust takes these basic elements and changes them, adapts them, modifies them to fit their own politics, priorities, and needs in their communities. So the first cluster of features is how does the community land trust deal with the real estate? It's an innovative form of ownership. It's a two-party form of ownership, where one party owns the land, and another party owns the structural improvements on the land. So we've separated out ownership. And what ties those interests together is a ground lease that is very long-term, 99 years typically. It's inheritable and it's mortgageable. That is, the people who own the buildings on the land trust land can go out and go to a private lender or a public funder and borrow money in a mortgage for the improvements on the leased land. My example up there shows a single family detached house on a separate parcel of land. But the fact is, anything you can build on land, anything you can do with land, a community land trust has done it somewhere in the United States or somewhere in the world. Here's some examples from CLTs in the United States. We have rental housing, cooperative housing, homeless shelters, manufactured housing, we're called mobile home parks. We also have a number of CLTs that are not doing housing or they're doing, in addition to housing, they're doing commercial development. They're doing job creation. Up here we have a gas station on a CLT in Bolinas, California. We have a commercial greenhouse in Boston, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. And one of my favorites is the, uh, the one down here in the corner. That's actually not in the United States. That's in Cumbria, England, the Butcher Arms. That's a cooperative pub that was developed by the Community Land Trust in uh, Crosby Ravensworth. And in the interest of full disclosure, this is a cooperative and they sold shares to a lot of people, including my family. So in the interest of full disclosure, <laughs> my family and I own 300 shares in that cooperative pub in Cumbria. 
So if you're ever in Crosby Ravensworth, you know, I won't be there to pull a pint for you, but walk in there and say, John sent you. <laughs> Here's what we do with organization. That's second cluster of features. It's a nonprofit organization that owns the underlying land. It's a membership-based organization. And it's a board with a balance of interest. The classic CLT in the United States is structured this way, where anyone from our geographic area that we have called our community may become a voting member of the organization. Anyone who lives on our land in some of our housing, they may nominate and elect part of the board. They're part of the membership. So the people who live on the land nominate and elect a third of the seats on the board. The people who live in the surrounding geography but who do not live on our land, they nominate and elect a third. And then the last third we reserve for public officials. We usually have a banker on there. We always have an attorney on there. So that's kind of a mix. That's our public interest category. But two-thirds of the board are directly nominated and elected by our membership. That's where the power lies. But because we have divided the interest, because no one voting block holds a majority of the seats, a premium is put on compromise, on public talk, on negotiation. And it gives a lot of stability to these organizations. Operation, the last cluster of features. Most community land trusts are set up, organized, so that the majority of their resources serve people who have been excluded from the economic and political mainstream. In the liberation theology of uh, the 60s and 70s, when many of these community land trusts were getting started, there is a preferential option for the poor. We sell off the structural improvements, we, the land trust. But we retain the right to protect the affordability of those buildings that we don't own. We also have a right to step in and make sure and to assist the homeowners, the co-ops, the condo owners in doing repairs and doing replacement. And in times of meltdown, like in our Great Recession, where everybody in our market was upside down and foreclosures were rampant, we stand behind our deals so the land trust, as the, as the landowner, has a durable right to step in and prevent foreclosures, to protect the security of the people who own the buildings on our land. We think about stewardship, we sometimes talk about the three faces of stewardship. What we care about with these buildings that we don't own, but because of the ground lease, we can exert some control over. We care about the money, we care about the building, we care about the people. So the three faces of stewardship, preserve affordability, one resale after another. Make sure the buildings don't deteriorate because of deferred maintenance and step in to protect security of tenure when the market does this. So, a lot of complicated features. This is the elevator speech. <laughs> Community-led development on community-owned land of permanently affordable homes. That matches up to our three circles in the model. So, why do we do it this strange way? I mean, this is a pretty odd way to do housing development, real estate <coughs> development, neighborhood revitalization. We do it first and foremost because if you own the land as a nonprofit organization representing a community of people and accountable to that community, you get to control what happens on that land and who that development serves. But it's not enough just to help people get into housing. It's not enough just to build good projects unless they remain affordable, remain in good condition, and don't allow the banks to get them when people get in trouble. Then equitable development is not sustained. So we say that we own the land, 
and reexert these continuing controls over the improvements because of equitable development and sustainable development. And in the world of community land trust, they are never separated. They are two sides of the same coin. Right? So I'm going to give you just a quick introduction to where this came from. Um, I'm going to cover about 150 years of history in about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, so and I'll show you where you can find out more about this. But the development of community land trust, I said we all borrow from each other. We're all influenced by each other. This is kind of the mayor's nest. This is my little uh, uh, line, you know, circles and diagrams um, of who influenced who. Pretty complicated stuff. Don't have time to go through all of that. Wouldn't understand it if we did. I have made it very simple. I'm going to go back to my three clusters of features and give you an idea of where some of these ideas came from. Because even though we say that New Communities was the first community land trust, the fact is these ideas, these precedents, predated New Communities. New Communities borrowed ideas from somebody else. And of course, this idea, this notion of land being treated differently than the structural improvements on it, <coughs> this idea that the land itself has a special quality and belongs to all of us has a long, long history. And outside the United States, in particular, there are many cultural and religious traditions that treated the land differently than the structures on top of the land where the land was seen as part of our common heritage or a community's heritage. And of course, in North America, there were people here before the Europeans arrived. And to the native peoples of this, of, of this continent, this whole idea of buying and selling land, how strange an idea was that? The Europeans showed up and said, look, we're going to chop up the land and we're going to sell it to each other, and then we're going to resell it, and we're going to make a bundle. The Native Americans looked at those, those Europeans and said, you've got to be crazy. It, it's, it would be as easy to sell the, the freshness of the sky, the sparkle of the water. Of course, there was another tradition that became the dominant tradition that pushed aside the Native American ethic of land, land stewardship. <coughs> And that is, when the Europeans came, they looked at land in a very different way. In the United States in particular, many of our founding fathers made their fortunes as land speculators, buying and selling land. That's how they got wealthy, including the father of our country, who was a surveyor and a land speculator long before he became a soldier and the first president of the United States. So deeply ingrained in the US psyche and in our ethics and our values is this idea of land speculation as our heritage, our God-given American right, that we had one of our, what I think is one of our premier political scientists in the United States, Thorsten Veblen, who said, you know, the great American game is not baseball. It's land speculation. Everybody wants to be a speculator. Now, there's always been another tradition underlying all of this that kind of pushed back against the dominant tradition. And from the very beginning, we had towns in the United States, before it was the United States, that would set aside lands as the commons, a different way of looking at land. Even some of our first intellectual forebears looked at land differently than they looked at the structural improvements on it. This is a quote from uh, Thomas Paine, the author of a revolutionary manual called Common Sense, and an even more radical tract later on called uh, Agrarian Justice. Even Honest Abe thought that, you know, we really ought to be treating land differently than the buildings on it. 
But the fella who took this whole idea of let's treat the land differently than the structural improvements, the furthest was a fella named Henry George. All right, I ask you to put up your hands when I wanted to hear who knew about CLTs and Milton Park. How many of you have ever heard of Henry George? Uh, there are a few of you. All right. Well, during his lifetime, Henry George was one of the best known public intellectuals, public officials, public figures in the United States. But, you know, fame is fleeting, and even if somebody who is as well known as the president or members of the Congress in his day, people don't remember Henry George. But, how many are you know this? <laughs> All right, put up your hands. How many of you played Monopoly? <laughs> All right. So let me ask you, how do you win at Monopoly? Uh, say that? Yeah, you buy it? Okay, that's the strategy, but how do you win? Yeah. By ruining the people. By stealing. Yeah. What you do is you, do, you buy up as much as you can, you develop the heck out of it, and then you wait for members of your family to <laughs> land on Park Place or, or Boardwalk, right? Yes, sir. To, to win in Monopoly, we have to raise uh, our rents again and again until people can no longer pay and uh, get on the street. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> You're, the whole game of Monopoly is you try to bankrupt everybody else in the game, you build all your wealth, and you drive them out of the game. Well, Monopoly was actually invented in 1904 by a woman in Philadelphia named Lizzie Maggie who wanted to teach people about Henry George. Because Henry George said, you know, this is the way it works in society as a whole. The reason we have people with a lot of wealth and other people with a lot of poverty is because the people with a lot of wealth control the land, they control the real estate, and they bankrupt the rest of us. His solution for this uh, poor state of affairs was let's just tax it all away. The government should tax away all the land gains, all the appreciation. That was his strategy, he called it the single tax. Now his idea uh, jumped the oceans because Henry George jumped the oceans. He went on the road. He took his ideas on the road. He sold books. He sold three million copies of Progress and Poverty in his day. And one of the places he landed was in England where a gentleman named Ebenezer Howard came to an early lecture of Henry George and he said, you know, this idea of taxing away all of the social increment, all of the appreciation, all the land gains, probably not gonna fly politically. But what we can do is we can create new towns where the land is publicly owned, or at least owned in trust, and then people will build on those public lands. It was a prototype community land trust. He called these communities the Garden Cities. How many of you have gone to planning school and studied Ebenezer Howard? Oh, look at this. Heavens to Betsy. All right. <laughs> what you probably learned is the garden cities are about design. They're about good architecture. They're about big boulevards. What you may not have learned is they were also about community ownership of land. About 35 garden cities were created in England between the, the time of uh, the publication of Garden Cities of Tomorrow and the 50s. And I always like to put this slide up because the Garden Cities were not just about housing. They were complete urban economies. And the idea of community-owned <coughs> land was not just to develop housing, it was also for orchards. It was for shops, it was for industry, and it was for the first Nabisco Shredded Wheat Factory in England. So the next time you have Nabisco Shredded Wheat, think about community land trust. 
the capital city of Canberra, was built on leased land. The Jewish National Fund in its heyday, in its early days, uh, when it was still young and progressive, um, they also adopted the idea from Henry George of hang on to the land, lease out the land to cooperative communities, to kibbutzim, moshavim. Unfortunately, I think they became a little too big, a little too aggressive, um, so they're not the same as they were today, but you had this large scale ownership of land separate from the ownership of the buildings. The ideas came back across the ocean, influenced people in the US. Uh, one fellow who was influenced was Arthur Morgan, who was one of the chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority under Franklin Roosevelt. In his lifetime, he created a couple of leased land communities. Another fellow was influenced by these ideas, both Henry George in the US and Ebenezer Howard in England, was a fellow named Ralph Borsodi, who in 1936 moved out of New York City, bought himself a big plot of land, invited his friends and neighbors up to build houses on the land, and he was the first one to call these planned settlements on leased land a land trust. He was also so hostile to the idea of treating land as property in all of his writing, he published something like 17 books and pamphlets in his time, he would refuse to talk about, refer to land as property. He always called it trusterty. Well, they never quite caught on. We still think of land as property. Um, and even Borsodi had a hard time getting his ideas across. And lest you think that all of the people in this story are guys, it always really took a woman to take some of these ideas and implement them. And I have noticed that one of the books out there on the table was written by Mildred Loomis, who is a student of Ralph Borsodi, took a lot of his ideas, took ideas from Ebenezer Howard, and put them in her own language. And she was a much more approachable and powerful teacher than Borsodi and a lot of these other guys. So they influenced a whole nother generation of leased land communities, land trusts, including this one right outside of Philadelphia. Now, all of these experiments of planned settlements on leased land, these were land trusts, but they weren't community land trusts. The only people who controlled the community land trust controlled the organization were the people who were on the land. There were no seats for the larger community. There were what a later land trust activist Bob Swan called enclaves. Nor did they protect the affordability of the buildings on the land. So these were land trusts, but they weren't yet community land trusts. So let's take a look quickly at the second element and then I'm going to take a break. You're going to take a break from me, and we're going to see a film. So here is the second element, organization. And these are the folks who put the C in CLT. These were the people who said, you know, it's not enough to have a land trust, not enough to have ownership of the land. Where's the community? Where's the social base? Where's the larger membership? And it really came out of the movement in Albany, Georgia, called the Albany Movement, which was a civil rights struggle in Southwest Georgia, led by two cousins of Martin Luther King Jr. Slater King was the only African American realtor, real estate broker, uh, in Southwest Georgia at the time. His brother, C.B. King, was the only African American attorney in Southwest Georgia. In fact, he was one of only three black attorneys in all of Georgia at the time. The two of them were joined by a remarkable couple, Charles and Shirley Sherrod. They were kind of the young Turks, nipping at the heels of the, their more conservative elders, because they came out of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They were the ones going out into the countryside and registering people to vote. They were the ones that were out there getting their heads beat as they were trying to get people to register to vote. 
1968, the leaders of the Albany movement joined with some other civil rights activists that came out of the cooperative movement, the uh, Southern Sharecroppers uh, Organization, and a couple of activists from the North, and they found some money to go to Israel because they wanted to look at these agricultural communities on leased land. They came back after a month in Israel, and they were really taken by the Moshav model, not by the kibbutzim. They said, you know, kibbutz, this collective child rearing, that's never going to work with African Americans in the Deep South. But this idea of the Moshav, community ownership of land, leasing of land, cooperative organization of agriculture, but individual ownership of the buildings, individual homesteads, you know, I think that kind of a model might work. They came back and they called together leaders from civil rights organizations, actually almost every civil rights organization in the South that had land as one of their issues on their agenda was invited to this meeting. And out of that, they created a blueprint for a new organization that was New Communities Incorporated. The idea of perpetual ownership of land, an open membership, and they call it a community land trust. Now what I learned some time ago is that I can tell the story of new communities, but the people who lived it, who did it, are much more eloquent than I am, and it's their story. So with some friends of mine who are much better filmmakers than I am, I managed to uh, convince them that this was a story worth filming. So this is about a 20 minute documentary. It's a story of new communities in Southwest Georgia. So we're going to do a little razzle dazzle with the. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. We're going to get it hooked up. I'm sorry, they are not French subtitles. They are English subtitles. But what I learned some time ago is that uh, even folks in the U.S. who grew up speaking English, many of them, particularly white folks, have a hard time understanding the Southern accent. So. Uh, I started using the English subtitles for all of my northern neighbors who couldn't speak Southern. So hopefully that will help. Let's try it. sharecroppers and tenant farmers in Georgia, in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Tennessee. And when they attempted to register to vote, they were forced off of the land. They were living on plantation, living on some other person's land. You can help people fight for their rights, but when they don't have a base, when they don't have something that they own and they get kicked off the property. That's a really, really, really tough position. It was a growing feeling on the part of so many individuals and leaders within the movement that if you had your own piece of land, you could do things. You wouldn't be dependent on others. Southwest Georgia in 1961 after the Freedom Ride to do voter registration in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Well, you had thousands of low income African American. They could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. We were building a better life for our people. 
we were always doing voter registration and that we were always doing direct action. When they begin to arrest us, we fill the jails in Albany. Thought that'd be enough for us to fill the jails. But they start sending our people to adjacent counties. One boy got his jaw broken. One lady was kicked in her rear and lost her baby. A lot of violence occurred and a lot of hurt from our people. My father was murdered March 25th, 1965. He was murdered by a white man who was never prosecuted. I made a commitment on the night of my father's death that I would not leave the South, that I would stay and devote my life to working for change. I was actually 17 years old, was not involved in the civil rights movement at that time, and didn't know how I would carry out that commitment. I've been hearing about this person, Charles Sherrod. I went to my first mass meeting and I saw how he had led people there in Baker County to stand up. And they were saying all of these great things in the mass meeting and planning um, for more demonstrations and planning the other things to be done and singing. Oh, the singing was just great, and I remember being in that meeting and just crying. And I knew then that this was a way that I could live true to the commitment that I made. And by June of 65, we started the Baker County Movement with the help of Charles Sherrod and others from SNCC. I was canvassing on the plantation. I knocked on the door of a man and his wife they promised me they'd come to the mass meeting. They come to the church with their five children. They told me that they had been kicked off the plantation, had nowhere to go for the night. How many people whose doors I knocked on got kicked out of their homes with their children without a job. And I was the partially cause of it. So I live in, in deep guilt and frustration. So that's how the spark of the need for land came to me. Seeing the land just the land itself, the beauty of the land, the purity of the land, and the acknowledgement that all power comes from the land, and the land comes from God. All power comes from the land. Absolute power comes from God. And that's my ministry. It's still my ministry. farm in Lee County was available. 
It was 1969, I believe, when he was killed in a car wreck. Slater King and I were very close. Losing him was like losing the brother. So devastating to what we were trying to do, which meant that Sherrod had to step up even more if we were going to hold on to this. I hadn't raised any money in my life except a place to stay and, and food to eat. I was, uh, that's my only hustling capabilities. But I got on the road and kissed my wife goodbye. Said, I'm going to get this money. And I raised it. Somehow I raised it over a million dollars. The idea behind New Communities was to take civil rights one step further. Um, into economic independence and economic rights, using agriculture as the economic base. New Communities was near Albany, Georgia, in Southwest Georgia. It was 6,000 acres of land. It was the largest tract of land owned by African Americans in the country at the time. So it was a source of pride. I think black people even if they were not involved, felt proud that, that we could actually get our hands on that much land. You know, land meant power. You know, land established you as somebody. It was a courageous and brilliant idea to bring people together in a new way of thinking, in a new way of doing something, cooperative, land ownership, not just an individual, but a community. Many of us during the early days of the movement, we spoke about it, we talked about it, and even today some of us still talk and preach about the building of a beloved community. More cooperative living, cooperative buying, cooperative selling, cooperative and just about everything cooperative. We received the planning grant of nearly $100,000 from the Office of Economic Opportunity. So we've gone from fighting for our rights to now having rights and trying to do something with it. It was some exciting times, you know. You're planning villages, you're planning education, you're planning all of these things. You, you basically have a chance to plan a life and lives and plan ways to help our people. We had a list of 500 families who were willing to live on this land the way we were posed. You would own your home, but you would lease the land underneath your home. Some of us were naive enough to believe that having been called lazy, not up to anything, ignorant that white people would praise us that we're finally doing something for ourselves on our own, with our own money, with our own resources, and sticking together. Just didn't think people would fight you when you were trying to simply help yourself. You're not asking them for anything. So I was really shocked at the opposition. I mean, they, they just came at us in every way to try to, to stop us, to block us, to, to do anything to get that land away from us. They shot in our offices. They diluted our fertilizer. They wouldn't give us loans. 
Washington had assured us that we would get the major grant to implement a lot of these plans that we have worked so hard to develop. But that didn't happen. Lester Maddox was governor of the state of Georgia when the money was officially vetoed. We couldn't build homes, we couldn't implement all of the many plans we had put in place, but we could hold on to the land by farming, and that's what we were doing. We grew everything from strawberries and sugarcane and collard greens and turnip greens and grapes. Part of my responsibilities was to market the hogs and the cows. We grew seed corn and soybeans and everything that could grow. We were doing quite well after a while. We could make enough money to pay the land notes and expand the farm operation. But then we had a drought and then followed by a second year of drought. So we decided, just like all farmers were doing, to go to Farmers Home Administration to borrow money. The farm manager and my husband went over to the office in Dawson, Georgia, and the guy said, you'll get a loan here over my dead body. And he meant it. We actually faced foreclosure, and Sherrod was out traveling around the country trying to raise money. Well, we're about to lose our land. And it's a thing of uh, a lot of pain to me, to my family, to other, other families that are associated with this project. And we don't see any way out of it. We were basically kicked off the land, and, and what they did was they, they dug holes and pushed all of our buildings over in them. Every building but that main house and the shed that was on the property, they dug a hole and pushed them in them. So we were gone. We want justice, Lord, to the Many black farmers were losing their land because they didn't have access to credit. We would meet and we'd talk about the fact that we have to do something about black land loss. We need to file a lawsuit. We want justice laws to the We want justice One of the heroines in this story is Rose Sanders and you know, here's this African-American attorney in Alabama dedicated to the idea that this can be done and that this case was triable and winnable. And she doggedly pursued it. We didn't hear anything else on our case until July, the night of July 8, 2009. That's when our lawyer called our house. I answered the phone. She said, Shirley, have you heard? I said, no. She said, we won. She's all excited. You know, it's 10 years now, you know? So I said, really? She said, you want to guess how much? I said, well, roses is at least a million dollars. And she said, Shirley is 12. So it was just so unbelievable. We were happy, and I think both of us cried. You know, it was really, really something. Just, we fought. We were hoping that we'd get something. But now, we could continue with the dream. Someone suggested that we should look at Cypress Pond Plantation. So one Sunday morning, we came out here. We went in that, that big antebellum home, and I just had a problem with antebellum. Why would we want 
an antebellum home, a plantation. That place was once owned by the largest slave owner and the wealthiest man in Georgia. Then I started looking at this and saying, this is where we were supposed to be. What a statement to our people that this could go from, from a slave owner to descendants of slaves. We're just in the development stage. We got the pecan in production, about 80 acres of pecans. We're getting the irrigation put in on them. This year we're expecting a great crop because we will have water. My major was horticulture, and I, I've had a farm of my own. Uh, of course, I lost my farm back in 85 when we had a disaster, and prior to that, we had a lot of drought. And uh, at the same time, that the new community lost their property. And that's why I'm here so determined to make things work and do whatever I can. Losing the farm was torturous and very sad. But to have the settlement, to have this land. Who could have predicted this road and this path? In some ways, it is the Ark of Justice. We all own it together. It's ours. We can actually start here to help people understand land trust, to help start land trust. Maybe get people to listen to us a little more when you bring them to this place out here now. They know everything is possible. We couldn't have done any better, I don't think. Looking for a place after all of these years, after the loss we've been through, to really help our people heal, to help get them training, and to get them working together for the good of all. generation of young CLT activists and cooperators in the U.S. And it, at some point in a, a rare burst of humility, I realized, you know, these folks could tell their own story a lot better than I could. I think you agree. So the first community land trust after new communities in the United States were formed in rural areas. Um, you know, in Appalachia, in rural Maine, in Georgia, Tennessee. It really wasn't until 1981 that the model made a leap into the cities. And at that point, people said, well, you know, these early land trusts, even new communities, they did a good job of the community ownership of land. They did a good job of building 
their base. Advance this a little bit here. There we go. Okay. But until it, you know, until we went into the cities, I think people didn't realize that it was not enough to own the land. It was not enough to build your base of support. You also had to put those durable controls over the buildings themselves. Because in a hot urban market, it was very easy to lose the affordability, the quality, the security of rental or home ownership, even though you own the land. So once it leapt to the city, the model changed somewhat. We added some of those operational elements to the model. It wasn't just enough owning the land, it wasn't just enough leasing it out and building structural improvements on it and building your base. You also had to think about permanent affordability, permanent responsibility. And once it made that leap into urban settings, I think the number of CLTs really took off. This is kind of a, a timeline, a trend line over time from the starting with the new communities in 1970. By 2013, we had about 260 community land trusts in the U.S. Now we have about 280. So I flew through the history. If you have any interest in more details, if you are a history buff and you want to learn stories about more of the people who are involved in the early community land trusts that are involved today, this is a website where we've posted a lot of documents, a lot of photographs, and a lot of video. We've recently migrated the site to the Global Land Alliance website, so you can find all those documents now over there at the Global Land Alliance. So I want to wrap up with a very quick reflection on how did we get that trend line to go up? How did we go from one community land trust in southwest Georgia in 1969 to 280 community land trust today. And then I want to give you a chance to talk, and we want to give, uh, where is, yeah, and we're going to talk some about what's going on right here in, in Montreal. So I'll be very quick. So I thought I'd start out, what did we do right to build, you know, move that line up? So I had to come up with a nice acronym. So the one I came up with was COPE. And here is what COPE stands for. I think this is what we've done right in building our community land trust movement in the United States. C starts with reflective practitioners. Sooner or later, people have to stick out their necks and go out there and do it. This is not theoretical. You've got to take the risk and you do your first house, you do your first co-op, you do your first shop and then you build from there. But you've got to have these people who step up and do it, your leaders, your thinkers, your activists. And they have to learn from each other. What we discovered in the US is there were no experts. We were kind of making up this community land trust as we went along. We were assembling the airplane in midair. And the best way to learn how to do it was to learn from each other. So every year we would come together and learn from each other. Everybody was an expert. And then we organized regional and national networks to regularize these connections among our practitioners. So that's the C. The O is organizing. You've got to build your base. If you're going to be successful with a membership-based organization, and a three-part board, you've got to spend a lot of time building that base, educating, answering questions. You can't be a developer without also being an organizer. And in the US in particular, it was important for us not only to get the support of the people at the grassroots, but because so much money, state money, federal money, local money flows through the municipal 
offers. They're the gatekeepers. We had to enlist public officials as partners in mm -hmm. these endeavors. Mm -hmm. that, they hold the money, they hold the land. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they were reluctant partners, but you organize well enough and they become partners. The P is proof of concept. Sooner or later, we had to create successful organizations, successful projects, and then we had to brag about it. We made videos about it. We wrote books about it. We had newspaper articles about it. But we had to get the word out, and we had to have a few poster child, poster children that were you know, out there saying, look, you really could do it. And we had to prove that this odd duck model actually works. And in particular, that stewardship works. That if you have an organization standing behind your low-income renters, your low-income homeowners, your low-income cooperators, then you were more successful at dealing with the fluctuations in the market. Because our housing, our people, the public investment gets lost either when the market is really hot and you lose affordability or when the market dives and you lose the housing altogether through foreclosure as we learned in the Great Recession. People down below the, uh, uh, our border, down there in the, the US, tend to talk about this idea of stewardship as being counter cyclical. It works when the market really well, when the market is particularly hot, and when the market is very cold. And finally, we tried not to be so rigid with our classic CLT that we were not open to innovation and to variation. What people call keeping the edges hot. And many CLTs started out just with a single family detached houses, but we learned that you could combine the community land trust with rental housing and with co-ops. And you could combine it with movie theaters and gas stations and food co-ops. Variation was very important. You could also graft this approach to community development of affordable housing onto the shell of a pre-existing organization, a Habitat for Humanity affiliate, a community development financial institution, an existing cooperative, an existing community development corporation. Okay. That's what I think we did right. I would be remiss if I didn't end by talking a little bit about what I think we're doing wrong in the CLT movement in the United States here and now. And I've got another acronym for that one. This one, instead of COPE, I call this one DOPE. And by DOPE, I don't mean that kind of DOPE. I don't mean that kind of dope. <laughs> I mean the kind of dope when, despite your best intentions, you just get things backwards. <laughs> so what dope stands for are these four words. And here's quickly what I mean by that. The D is, I think we've gotten to the point where we're spending so much time focused on housing that we forget that this model is very flexible and very powerful for more than housing. Mm -hmm. Housing's great, but what about parks? What about cooperative supermarkets? What about gas stations? You know, we've gotta do more things with it. We, in the United States, we've sort of forgotten that lesson from Ebenezer Howard and the Garden Cities is you can create complete urban or rural economies on the foundation of community-owned land. The O, I think we are good organizers. I think it's part of the success. But I have to go back to the O and say, as a movement in the United States, we've gotten really, really good with the aspects of organizing, of messaging, and marketing. I think what we're doing less well today, almost a victim of our own success, is organizing as engagement with the people who are in our homes and building a base of power in our communities. Mm -hmm. You remember this quote from Charles Sherrod? All power comes from the land. Well, you know, I think the reverse is true. And what we've discovered in the United States 
that you don't get land without power. He is for people. We are not doing a good enough job in the United States of building our bench. Too many of the leaders of our movement, too many of the executive directors of community land trust, too many board members look like me. So we, need, we have to be cultivating, bringing up the next generation. And I don't think in the United States we are doing enough to bring in young people to diversify our leadership. Um, and I think we've got to pay attention to that. Finally, and it really is the final thing that I'm going to say before I give it to you and to Sophie Marie, um, and that is the E is for erosion. The Community Land Trust works best as a whole. People often say to me, well, but, but which one of those components is most important. And I say, no, the whole is what is important. And you know what is happening often in the United States is we're starting to separate mm -hmm. the components. Mm -hmm. So we have community land trust that have gotten rid of the C mm -hmm. because it's a lot easier to have top-down organizations mm -hmm. or organizations controlled by city governments. Some community land trust are using D covenants rather than actually owning the land. And too many community land trusts are focused only on housing and thinking, well, you know, what trust means <coughs> is not the three faces of stewardship. It's really only about affordability. I think that's a mistake because I think the real power of this model is when all three of those components are together, when one is complementing the other. <laughs> end with a story that may not seem immediately relevant, but when I was a young man, I was a community organizer in Appalachia. I hide behind that old coal miner there. There I am peeking out there from the, from the back. And I was part of an organization that went to Appalachia to do grassroots community organizing. And one of my friends, Charles Schiff, decided he really wanted to immerse himself in the Appalachian culture so he wanted to learn how to play the country fiddle. So he found an old fiddler up in the mountains to teach him how to play the fiddle. And Charles thought it would be very easy because he already played the guitar. But time after time, the old fiddler would say, Charles, listen, any damn fool can figure out where to put his fingers. The music is in the bow, boy. The music is in the bow. What's the, the, bow? the bow of the fiddle. Mm -hmm. So the relevance of this to my story is that I think the music is really in the whole. Mm -hmm. The music happens in the spaces. The genius of the model is when all of the components are playing together. The music is in the whole. That's my story. Thank you. So, you know, you remember the old S trainings where people would come in, they'd lock the door, and no one could leave because you had to hear the full message? This is not an S training. So it's hot. It's beginning to get late, so anybody who wants to leave, you're not going to be dissing either one of us, so feel free. But for those who would like to stick around a little longer, I'm going to pass the mic, and we're also going to ask you to, if you have questions, read us. Yes. Are you ready? Yes. You okay. Thank you, John. Um, j just before I get started with this, I'm, I'm going to switch to French, but I want to make sure you understand this part. Um, you know, John has 40 years and more of experience, but every time I hear him speak about CLTs, it's more, um, it's not the experience that I feel so much as the joy and this deep love for this model, and it's always extremely inspiring. So, what I want to do in five minutes with you, there are probably people in the room who know the middle of the habitation, the abordable, the models of speculative, but there are probably people for whom it's a bit of a grand fouillis, and we don't see it anymore. 
Donc, ce que je voulais faire bien rapidement, euh, sans trop rentrer dans les détails, mais c'est d'un peu de replacer où sont les cartes. Euh, ben, où sont les cartes? Qui fait quoi en ce moment un peu au Québec? On a plein d'outils antispéculatifs qui existent. Et euh, en fait, souvent on pense aux fiducies foncières communautaires. On est comme « Ah! Oh, nous sommes si loin du but! » Puis non, en fait, on a déjà plein d'outils qui existent au Québec. Et j'adore l'analogie que John vient de faire par rapport à là, il faut les faire... Euh, voyons. Faut, oui, les mettre en musique. Merci. Donc, les mettre en musique ensemble. Et euh, on a beaucoup de CL, de CT, de LT, donc c'est de voir comment tout ça peut créer un CLT. Euh, je, je vous laisserai à vous après ça de vous dire bon, comment on peut combiner euh, tout ça pour aller plus loin, plus loin tout le monde ensemble. Donc qu'est-ce qui existe de non spéculatif, de perpétuellement abordable au Québec en ce moment comme modèle? Euh, je vais les passer rapidement, puis ensuite je vais vous donner à peu près huit exemples un peu plus en détail, juste pour qu'on mette là, des... Euh, des images là-dessus un peu plus clairement. Euh, ben, il y a tout l'univers des propriétés parapubliques. Pour commencer, il euh, ne faudrait quand même pas les passer sous silence. Oui. Tous les HLM, euh, si vous payez votre loyer à un office municipal d'habitation ou la Société d'habitation de Montréal, vous habitez dans une propriété parapublique. Et de par la nature de votre propriétaire, ben, vous êtes dans une propriété qui est non spéculative, qui est retirée du marché spéculatif. Euh, si vous habitez dans un OBNL, c'est la même chose. La gouvernance, la mission de l'OBNL fait que cette propriété-là ne sera pas remise sur le marché spéculatif. C'est un outil de différent que les trusts qui sont utilisés euh, aux États-Unis, mais ça, ça accomplit la même fin. On a des, 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 ce que j'appelle les OBNL autonomes et les OBNL regroupés. Euh, si vous googlez ça, vous n'allez probablement rien trouver. C'est moi qui l'ai séparé comme ça hier. Mais en gros, tout ce qu'on qu peut voir, c'est qu'il y a des OBNL qui existent. C'est un building de 10 logements qui est un OBNL qui existe en lui-même. Puis il y a d'autres structures où les OBNL sont regroupés ensemble dans une gouvernance plus large. Je vais donner un exemple de ça tantôt. Ensuite, on rentre dans le monde des coopératives d'habitation. Euh, c'est un modèle qui a été amplement développé au Québec, dont on peut être fier. Euh, le Québec a vraiment fait euh, figure de pionnier là-dessus euh, depuis les années 70. Donc, la même chose, on retrouve des coopératives que je dirais euh, autonomes, au sens où ben, vous avez une coop, puis vous avez votre CA de coop, puis elle tient à elle tout seule. On a des modèles de coopératives qui se sont regroupés ensemble, donc qui ont une gouvernance plus large qui englobe toutes les coops. Et euh, il y a ce que j'appellerais les coopératives alternatives ou hors programme, parce que autant pour les OBNL que pour les coop, en ce moment au Québec, généralement, ils sont financés par de l'argent gouvernemental. Et surtout dans le milieu co coopératif, là, on commence à voir des initiatives ci et là qui se disent « bon, comment qu'on peut financer ça autrement et, euh, et innover un peu, explorer d'autres façons de faire? » Donc, je vais en parler un peu de ça aussi. C'est important de dire rapidement que ce qui garantit qu'une coopérative est non spéculative qui va toujours rester euh, en dehors du marché, c'est que la loi sur les coopératives au Québec euh, inscrit ça clairement dans la loi que la coop ne peut pas être remise euh, sur le marché régulier. Après ça, on a toutes les mesures en accès à la propriété. Euh, je vous avoue que c'est possiblement là au Québec qu'on traîne le plus la patte. Euh, les modèles de coopératives de propriétaires sur lesquels travaille en ce moment la CQCH, Confédération des coop d'habitation du Québec. Les propriétés à capitalisation partagée sur lesquelles je travaille personnellement avec Louise et Manon ici depuis quelques années, qui sont des façons en fait qui sont directement calquées sur les modèles de, de, des fiducies foncières communautaires américaines. C'est des façons de devenir propriétaire tout en sortant les propriétés de la spéculation. Et j'ai inclus là-dedans des modèles comme les Coavita, je vais en parler un petit peu plus tantôt, qui ne sont pas forcément anti-spéculatifs, mais qui, euh, dans leur structure légale, mais qui viennent d'une intention qui est clairement de créer un milieu de vie avant de spéculer. Donc, je pense que ça vaut la peine de les intégrer là-dedans. Après ça, quand on se déplace en milieu rural, on a toutes les éco-communautés, les éco-villages, les éco-hameaux, qui, encore une fois, n'ont pas toujours une structure juridique qui garantit qu'elles sont non spéculatives, mais l'intention est clairement de créer des communautés, de créer des milieux de vie bien avant de spéculer. Donc, je crois qu'ils ont leur place sur, sur ce tableau. Et finalement, les fiducies d'utilité sociale. Je pense que c'est là, des fois, qu'il y a beaucoup de confusion sur la question de « est-ce qu'on est un land trust? Est-ce qu'on est une fiducie foncière communautaire? » parce qu'on n'utilise pas l'outil de la fiducie. Rapidement, dans le Code civil, la fiducie d'utilité sociale est un outil légal extrêmement puissant pour garantir une abordabilité perpétuelle, mais c'est aussi un outil extrêmement contraignant, difficile.
difficile à financer, qui n'a pas la même portée légale qu'un trust dans le common law. Donc, peut-être de, déjà euh, séparer ces deux notions-là, mais ça n'empêche pas qu'on les utilise quand même déjà au Québec, surtout dans le milieu agricole. Donc, mettons, pour comprendre un peu plus ce que ça veut dire, quand je parlais d'un OBNL qui est autonome, bien, si vous voyez la Cité des bâtisseurs, qui est un, euh, un OBNL pour personnes âgées euh, dans le point de Saint-Charles, euh, je regarde, regarde, quand je dis point de Saint-Charles, <rire> allons au point de Saint-Charles, euh, qui a été financé avec la subvention Axélogie, euh, qui est la subvention du gouvernement du Québec pour financer ce genre de projet-là, en inclusion d'un projet de condo qu'on peut voir derrière, qui est le Nord de l'EC. Donc, c'est un OBNL qui a sa gouvernance séparée, qui garantit qu'il ne qu reviendra pas sur le marché régulier, mais qui, se, qui gouverne ses 115 logements euh, dans un, un écosystème fermé, je dirais. Une autre alternative pour les OBNL, c'est ce que j'appellerais les OBNL regroupés. C'est les OBNL qui appartiennent à des OBNL plus gros, comme à Montréal, à Interloge dans le centre-sud, à Chapelle dans Chicago maison neuve Solide dans Châteauguay. Donc Interloge, ça c'est un de leurs bâtiments ici dans le Faubourg-Québec. Euh, Interloge détient 730 logements. Donc dans le fond, vous payez votre loyer tous les jours à un propriétaire. C'est juste qu'il s'avère que ce propriétaire-là, ben, c'est un OBNL que dans sa mission, il est écrit qu'il va garder votre loyer bas. Donc, ça, ça donne une, une sécurité et ça assure que le bâtiment ne retournera jamais sur le marché régulier. Pour les coopératives, en fait, euh, ici, vous avez la station 1 dans Hochelaga Maisonneuve, un super beau projet de récupération de bâtiments. Encore une fois, financé avec les fonds publics d'Axélogie, avec une structure de gouvernance qui est une coopérative au lieu d'être un OBNL, mais vous voyez, c'est un petit peu le, le même genre de, 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 de structure légale, je dirais. Mais non, pas en fait, pas du tout. C'est pas du tout le même genre de structure légale, mais ça, ça, ça crée un milieu de vie non spéculatif de la même manière. Les coopératives regroupées, j'ai mis Milton Park à défaut d'en trouver une autre, mais Milton Park, en fait, quand on parle de la communauté Milton Park, qui fête d'ailleurs son 30e anniversaire cette année, on parle de 600 logements, un peu plus de 600 logements, répartis dans 146 immeubles. Et il y en a 15 là-dedans qui sont des coopératives, il y en a 6 qui sont, nos, qui sont des OBNL, et il y en a d'autres qui sont des locaux commerciaux et ce genre d'affaires-là. Donc eux, chacune des coop, chacun des OBNL ont leur petite gouvernance séparée de coop et d'OBNL, mais ils se sont dotés d'une structure qui rassemble tout ce beau monde-là pour avoir aussi une vue globale sur euh, l'ensemble de la communauté et pas juste les coop individuellement. C'est pour ça qu'on parle de la communauté Milton Park et pas juste de chacune des coop séparées. Un autre exemple de coopérative euh, que je dirais un peu euh, alternative hors programme, euh, ça c'est un bâtiment qui est en construction en ce moment, qui est un projet de l'unité, l'unité de travail pour l'implantation du logement étudiant, donc c'est des coop étudiants. Il y a la gang de Brick par Brick, Sophie Brick par Brick, qui est là aussi, qui eux sont en train de travailler à savoir comment on pourrait financer des coop avec les obligations communautaire au lieu d'aller chercher des subventions, euh, l'utile le fond avec l'investissement d'impact. Donc, s'il y a du monde en ce moment, le, le, la gang de la Choc aussi, je pense, dans Hochelaga, travaille sur des modèles alternatifs. Donc, il y a beaucoup de monde qui gravite autour du réseau coopératif qui se disent « bon, mais comment on peut trouver d'autres façons de créer ces milieux de vie-là en ce moment? » L'accès à la propriété, sur le, le projet sur lequel je, je travaille personnellement, c'est de, de créer une forme d'accès à la propriété qui permet aux gens de devenir propriétaire sans mettre de mise de fonds, mais euh, de garder toujours ces propriétés-là dans une logique qui est non spéculative, en fait, grâce à une formule de partage de, de, le, de la plus-value, de l'appréciation de la valeur du marché. Et voilà. Cohabitat Québec, euh, qui est un projet dans la ville de Québec, le nom le dit. Euh, C'est 42 unités privées avec des espaces qui sont mis en commun pour que les gens, oui, aient leurs unités euh, individuelles, mais ont une vie de communauté aussi. Il n'y a pas de mécanisme anti-spéculatif à proprement dit. Puis je sais que dans plusieurs cohabitats, c'est une question qui commence à se poser en ce moment de se dire, ben là, on a tout fait ce travail-là pour créer un milieu de vie, puis là, on réalise que plus le temps passe, moins le projet est abordable, puis ce qu'on pourrait faire pour s'assurer que ces projets-là demeurent anti-spéculatifs. Donc, je pense quand même que ça vaut la peine de les inclure dans ces réflexions-là parce que clairement, il y a un désir de penser à nos communautés comme des milieux de vie, pas juste euh, comme des outils de spéculation. 
pour les éco-communautés, ici, vous avez le rang 13 à Saint-Camille, qui était en fait euh, une coopérative qui s'est créée pour ouvrir un champ dans lequel il n'y avait rien. Ils ont bâti toutes les infrastructures, euh, ils ont bâti euh, tout ce qu'il fallait en fait pour que 25 maisons soient construites en autoconstruction dans Saint-Camille. Dans le, dans, dans le contexte rural au Québec, c'est important de comprendre qu'ici à Montréal, on se demande comment on fait pour protéger nos milieux de vie de la spéculation et les contrôler collectivement. En milieu rural, souvent, la spéculation, ce n'est pas la première affaire qui est le problème. C'est comment on compte l'exode rural, comment on garde nos familles, euh, comment on garde nos jeunes dans nos quartiers, donc dans nos villes, dans nos villages. Donc, le rang 13, je pense, s'inscrit dans cette, euh, cette idée d'un un contrôle communautaire de la terre, même s'il n'y a pas forcément d'outils antispéculatifs qui sont mis de l'avant. Au niveau de qui utilise cet outil puissant dont je parlais tantôt, qui est la fiducie, la fiducie d'utilité sociale, vous avez ici euh, le éco hameau euh, de l'abbé et sa ferme, qui est les vallons de la Chambreuse, euh, qui, euh, en fait, j'ai parlé hier avec les gens de protecteurs qui les accompagnent dans la création d'une fiducie d'utilité sociale agricole pour s'assurer que les terres agricoles ne euh, retournent pas sur le marché spéculatif. Et on a un gros problème de spéculation sur les terres agricoles en ce moment au Québec. Et euh, en fait, ce qu'ils m'ont dit, qui m'a beaucoup enchanté, c'est qu'ils n'ont pas assez de se dire « on va faire une fiducie juste avec euh, les vallons de la Chambreuse, puis on va l'étendre à tout le, 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 le bas Saguenay Sud, incluant la ville de la Baie. Donc, c'est un très, très gros projet. Toutes les terres agricoles dans ce territoire-là seraient transformées en fiducie agricole pour s'assurer que leur vocation agricole demeure toujours. Et finalement, il y a plein d'autres projets qui ne sont pas forcément de l'habitation, mais qui euh, nous proposent une forme de propriété collective. Je crois que le, le collectif, c'est à nous, le bâtiment 7, est un OBNL, mais qui est possédé collectivement euh, par, euh, par les membres qui ont fondé le bâtiment 7. Donc, comme John le disait tout à l'heure, euh, oui, il faut penser à, à des modèles antispéculatifs pour l'habitation, mais il faut le faire aussi pour nos organismes communautaires, nos entreprises d'économie sociale, nos projets collectifs, puis sécuriser un accès au terrain pour tout ça. Donc, ça fait un tour... Euh, ah oui, juste rapidement, j'aimerais vous dire aussi qu'on a un réseau canadien de fiducie foncière communautaire ou de projets... Euh, tout le monde est un peu en crise existentielle. Est-ce qu'on est vraiment une fiducie? Est-ce qu'on a le droit d'en de, faire partie? Puis à un moment, on s'est dit, OK, ben, screw that, let's create the network and we'll figure it out later. <rire> so, donc, on est à peu près une vingtaine de projets qui sont en communication les uns avec les autres depuis, je dirais, deux, trois ans. On se rejoint euh, à chaque année euh, dans le cadre du Congrès américain des fiducies foncières. Et euh, cette année, ça va être la première fois qu'on va se rencontrer en sol canadien dans le cadre de la conférence From the Ground Up euh, à la mi-avril. Et il y a des échanges super intéressants qui commencent à se créer. Ça, c'est euh, nos, nos doux visages il y a deux ans en Californie lors de notre première rencontre en personne. Et j'aimerais dire juste rapidement, dans tous les, je vous ai dit, il y a 20 projets qui existent en ce moment, celui du Hogan Valley Land Trust. Euh, vous avez Lama, Antonia et Stéphanie là-bas. Euh, quand j'ai vu Arc of Justice, le documentaire, ça m'a fait beaucoup penser au travail qu'ils font. Euh, il y avait un quartier euh, historiquement noir dans Vancouver qui a été démoli pour faire passer une autoroute dans les années 50. Et la ville a annoncé dans les dernières années qu'elle allait démolir cette autoroute-là. Donc, des activistes de la communauté noire de, de, de Hogan's Alley sont en train de se réunir pour réclamer de faire de cet endroit-là un, une fiducie foncière euh, pour loger en priorité des membres de la communauté noire de Vancouver qui sont super inspirants. Mm -hmm. Euh, c'est un des nombreux projets très, très, très chouettes et très inspirants qui se passent en ce moment à l'échelle du Canada. Donc, je vous dis tout ça juste pour que vous sachiez un peu, OK, on ne parle pas de rien, ce n'est pas une page blanche, il y a plein d'affaires qu'on peut brasser, mettre ensemble, s'inspirer de ce que John nous a dit pour aller l'avant et pousser un petit peu plus loin nos modèles. Donc, voilà, le jour, euh, la période des questions. Oui. Ah, oui. Ah, oui. Je suis secrétaire de la Fédération des propres d'habitation intermunicipale du Montréal et de la qui regroupe à peu près 470 coopératives. Je voudrais juste dire que les expériences de villes du jardin, de, de, de territoires qui sont en fiducie, ça date de 1962 à Montréal avec le domaine de Saint-Sulpice. 
et le travail pionnier qu'a fait Berthe Loire, qui est une femme qui a créé le premier magasin d'alimentation pour c'était le familial, qui a fait un développement euh, de, dans le domaine Saint-Sulpice, où il y a plusieurs coopératives maintenant. Il y, a, euh, il y avait un coopérative, parce qu'il y avait un magasin d'alimentation, ils ont même créé une caisse pour la caisse du domaine Saint-Sulpice. Fait que des expériences comme ça, il y en a. Et il y a le village de Loverdale, qui est à Pierrefonds, 800 unités de logement. Il y en a beaucoup de projets de ce type-là. Le projet de l'étude d'art, c'est un projet important. Et il y en a d'autres aussi ailleurs. Et il ne faut pas juste regarder euh, le verre à moitié vide. Il y a le verre qui est aussi à moitié plein. D'autres questions? Commentaires? Encouragement au mouvement? Bonjour, Benoît Gagné. Je suis aussi à des chimes euh, bénévoles comme trésorier. Euh, je parle en anglais parce que je pose une question à, à, à notre invité. Euh, at the Vichim, it's the Federation of Housing Co-op in the region. Uh, we're working on a fostering uh, engagement uh, because we saw that a portion of our co-ops uh, are not doing that well because of involvement, of people involvement. Most are doing good, but a few are not. And I'd like to uh, hear about your insights regarding how to foster uh, a re renewal of engagement inside a, uh, a land trust or a co-op or whatever. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> I think, All of us who work with cooperatives, community land trusts, any community-based organization face that same <coughs> issue of constant renewal and recruitment and retention, right? How do you retain your members? How do you constantly renew their energy? How do you keep them from drifting away? I'm afraid we don't have any magic answers to that one. We have as many free riders as you do. But um, what we've learned is that we have to multiply the opportunities for people to be involved. If the only way they can become involved in our organizations is to serve on the board of directors, that's just not appropriate for most people because they don't want to. You know, that's not their thing. So I think we've learned that there have to be many opportunities, many different ways for people to participate. You don't just say, oh, governance, if you just have enough. We, once a year, we come together, we have an annual membership meeting, we elect our board. That's not enough. So we have to have work parties, right? We have to provide services beyond the housing. We have to do training. We have to bring in strange speakers like me to, uh, to talk about what they do in their community. But, um, you know, it's a, constant, it's a constant issue for us. And, of course, for us, we have two kinds of engagement, two kinds of organizing. One, we try to keep the people in the homes, on the land, involved in the organization. But we also try to be good organizers to engage, invite people in the surrounding geography who are not on our land to participate, you know, the community members. So we've got kind of a dual challenge there. And you know, sometimes we're better at one and sometimes we're better at the other. Um, and sometimes we get a pretty nice balance. But we've also learned that a lot of people just want to be left alone, right? That what they want is an opportunity to raise their families in a secure housing situation. And if they don't want to be involved in the organization, that's okay. We're not going to badger them. So you open the door, you invite them in, you find ways to involve them. And if they say, look, I've got too much going on in my life, I can't come out. That's okay. You know, uh, Oscar Wilde said that the problem with socialism is too many night meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's a pretty trenchant uh, criticism of a lot of the work that we do. And sometimes we just have to provide the services, the platform, the base, and then leave people alone. There's got to be food. <laughs> <laughs> because people are hungry. She yeah, says, and there's got to be food. Because That's people right. are hungry. 
You've got, that's right, you've got to feed. Every meeting we have, there's food. You're exactly right. Bon, justement, euh, la question de l'accessibilité et bon, accessibility. Bon, je sais que, bon, ici, à Montréal, moi, bon, je m'appelle Susanne Laponte de je travaille dans un centre de femmes ici à Montréal. Donc, euh, il y a toute la question euh, des besoins des femmes. Donc, les femmes ont des besoins particuliers dont vous n'avez pas parlé. Women have specific needs that both of you have not mentioned. And, uh, et aussi pour l'accessibilité, euh, il y a quand même euh, euh, des personnes qui sont exclues euh, bon, du logement social et communautaire au Québec. Euh, je pense euh, notamment euh, aux personnes sans statut, sans statut euh, migratoire, qui est une catégorie euh, euh, de personnes dans l'augmentation. Donc, euh, voilà, je voulais savoir euh, si vous avez euh, réfléchi à ça, s'il y a des pistes. Well, I, I can translate just yeah. because I, I think, what about um, all the people that are, well, if you understand, you can correct me if I don't yeah. uh, translate it right, but she was basically asking what about the people who don't um, have access to even um, affordable or even social housing because of um, legal status, or what about uh, yeah immigration rights and um, so right away I was thinking thinking about the San Martin Canyon de Peña CLT that uh, maybe you know more about it than I do but yeah no. but you say French and then I got okay okay yeah ça s'applique pas nécessairement au contexte québécois clairement je partage le même constat sur le le contexte québécois, puis je n'ai pas nécessairement toutes les solutions, puis je ne suis pas une experte dans ce domaine-là. Mais je pense qu'un des, euh, des CLT en ce moment que John a mentionné brièvement, c'est celui à Puerto Rico, San Martin Caño de Peña. Euh, il est magnifique. À, allez voir les vidéos, euh, ils ont gagné le World Habitat Award l'an dernier. En gros, c'était une communauté informelle qui, euh, qui, qui s'était installée sur pilotis le long d'un canal dans, euh, dans une partie de San Juan à Puerto Rico. Et à un moment donné, la communauté a voulu commencer à euh, nettoyer le canal, mais ils se sont dit, si on fait ça, le monde va comprendre à quel point c'est un prime spot <rire> dans la ville. On sent que la, la, la spéculation commence à monter, on voit les gratte-ciels qui commencent à poindre. Et c'était tous des gens non documentés qui n'avaient pas de titre de terre, euh, mais qui se sont dit, écoutez, si on se donne une propriété collective, si on, on se donne le droit de se créer un land trust, tout le monde ensemble, là, les gens qui n'ont pas de statut vont quand même peut-être être plus aptes à sortir de l'ombre parce qu'on leur, on, on, on leur, euh, on, on leur a donné un droit au foncier qu'il n'y avait pas avant. Puis comme euh, M. Sherrod a dit dans le, you know, With power, lands come with power, and the other. It, which way was it? <laughs> which way was it? Oh, you gotta have power to get land. But he said another way as well. <laughs> All, power is power. Power. All power comes from the land. Yeah. So, donc, c'est clair que dans ces statuts-là, il y a le fait d'être. En tout cas, je pense que c'est une réflexion à continuer sous l'angle de qui a, a l'accès au territoire, c'est clair. Mais je vais laisser John. I think the only thing I would add is that. People, particularly whose immigrant status is clouded, who are in the country illegally, um, or are trying to become citizens, not yet citizens, very difficult to get private mortgages uh, for folks like that. So, you know, one of the ways we try to address that is, uh, you know, we start, well, I'll take a quick digression, and that is, you know, we started out in Burlington thinking that we were only going to do home ownership. And we were only going to do home ownership in single family detached houses. And our very first house uh, was a single family detached house. It was for a librarian, single mom with two kids, very successful. And we said, ah, that's it. That's the model. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to do it again and again and again. The problem with that is that no matter how much subsidy we would bring into a deal, we can never get enough to get a lot of single family detached houses. So then we started doing duplexes, you know, side by side houses with a common wall and townhouses. And then we started doing condominiums, you know, what the English, what the, they call it in Britain, strata. I don't know. But anyway, we started doing condominiums, multi-unit, owner-occupied housing. 
but still with owner occupied housing people had to be individually mortgageable they had to be able to go to a bank and qualify for a mortgage so that ah, that's not working at least not for everybody so then we started doing co-ops and we came up here and we learned about co-ops and we said ah perfect that's going to reach a population that we couldn't otherwise reach and then we started doing rental housing lots and lots of rental housing we now have 2,000 units of rental housing in our portfolio with the Champlain Housing Trust down in Burlington more recently we've been doing homeless shelters single room occupancy and we've been working with a hospital to buy um, old motels so that when people were coming out of emergency rooms and were homeless you know they had some transitional housing that way we still don't have enough but what we've tried to do, we now have 3,000 units of housing in our portfolio, 160,000 square feet of commercial space. And what we try to do is create security of tenure at every rung on the ladder, but allow people and even encourage them to move from one rung on the ladder, one type and tenure of housing to another. So, and we never planned it this way, I gotta say. You know, this was serendipity. You know, at a certain point, we said, oh, look, we were thought we were just in the business of security, secure, affordable housing for low and moderate income people. But then, lo and behold, we realized we were also in the mobility business, that people were starting to move from one form of housing to another, but staying within our portfolio, within our community. And for engagement, that was really important because a lot of times organizations, you know, you're a victim of your own success. People do well, stabilize their situations, and they leave. And you leave, you know, you, you lose some of the most active, committed, you know, beneficiaries. We discovered when people have options and they can move, you know, they can move up the ladder, down the ladder. And now we don't even think of it as a ladder, we think of it as a wheel that goes two ways. And when you multiply your forms of tenure, your types and tenure inside the community land trust, people are able to choose where their situations fit the housing instead of getting stuck one place or another. So we discovered kind of serendipitously that we not only are committed to security of tenure, but we've also created lots of opportunities for mobility because people's situations change. And some people come in and they need to repair their credit as a renter for five years before they're ready to become a homeowner. Okay, that's great. We like that. Sorry, I can, you can see, I start telling one story and I go to another story. <laughs> this is your time, not mine. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Hello there. Um, I, 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 um, I'm um, 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 Nathan, and I, I, I've also been, I, I've, uh, I've also been helping out to, to um, on the, um, 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 conference and and on the and here the talk here, and I, I just want to also just I, I just want to say two, two two things very quickly to also just put things in, in more of a context. Um, it's clear that with the community land trusts in the states, there's a strong emphasis on 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 um, people owning um, on people owning yeah on, on, there's a strong emphasis. Uh, on um, um, home, yeah, people owning their own homes, right? But uh, I just want to be clear that um, that the, that here it's not ne that's not necessarily. I'm, I'm speaking just as I'm speaking personally now. That's not necessarily the ultimate, right? I think I think for me, and I'm, I'm very proud to live in the. In the, um, I'm very proud to live in the, um, 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 we, oui, yeah. <laughs> um, where there's no private ownership. There's, there's no private ownership, and no one can profit from, fr you know, fr from the project. So there's no speculation whatsoever. There's no ownership. There's nothing. It's only cooperative housing and not for profit housing, and in. And, and, and also he, here in um, um, Montreal, 
generally the cooperative movement is very strong in not having any private ownership. And I think that's something to be proud of. Um, and, um, and, you know, and I think like it, it's, it's, it's good for us to learn from what's happened elsewhere, but I, I would also say the cult of home ownership is um, not something to um, encourage, you know, it's, not, it's not something to um, necessarily encourage or promote, that we should be encouraging people to, 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 to not worry about ownership, but to be happy to live in a community that's where, where there's collective property, that's important. And the other thing I would say is, I, would, I'm, I, I, I don't speak as an expert, but I would say in the States, maybe the emphasis on home ownership is because there's not enough state funding for <laughs> housing, so that they have to fund it other ways, so one of those ways is through home ownership. And I'm very proud that the co-ops here don't, uh, you know, that for the moment, for the moment, um, they don't need, you know, ownership. I mean, that's not to say that maybe there's also, um, you know, maybe. Anyway, I, I'm not going to open the discussion. But um, the other thing I would say is, for me, um, community land trusts for me is uh, are very important because they challenge capitalism. So we haven't heard that word tonight, but I think it's very important. Capitalism, because um, we've. we've, we've um, as we're talking about land, as we're talking about power, we have to talk about capitalism because that's the big problem, right? Uh, because capitalism, where the private, where where a few people can own, you know, can have when one percent of the population can own, you know, a massive amount of the economic power and the lands. And you know, we we capitalism has its origins in colonialism as well. And colonialism is about land and about stealing the land and forcing the people off the land. And and you know, we know that from across the world in North America, Africa, and, and it's continuing and it's continuing. Um, so it's about challenging capitalism. It's about challenging colonialism. Um, and it's it's about um, challenging property. You know, property. And putting, um, uh, it's, it's about a certain collective control of land to remove property and speculation. And also it's about ecology. Um, because again, in ecology, the problem is capitalism. The problem is profit and exploitation of the land. And I think uh, community land trusts, in a broad sense, you know, the, the principle of the collective ownership of the land for what, for, for, um, social purposes. I think that's a solution. That's an ecological solution. You know, that's a, it's a very important ecological solution. So I just want to put that out there. I think it's very important. They're also if you're talking about capitalism, and power, and the, it's it's very nice to speak in very positive ways about you know community projects. But the enemy is out there. Yes. <laughs> the enemies and economically they're more powerful. They, they, they are more powerful, and they they're huge corporations that control Montreal, and we have to leave this room with our fists like this, <laughs> together. Because the only way, it's not just by a few nice little projects that we're gonna win, it's also we have to fight. And this means it's action. Class, it's a class struggle. Class struggle, it means occupations and squatting in parallel with doing projects, okay? So I just wanna put that on the table. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Ruby Sterling, and my question is for John. John, you were mentioning in your dope acronym that you have a hard time to reach younger people. Do you have any kind of explanation as why? Do you, you know, how come the movement cannot renew itself? Oh, I, I think we just haven't done enough. You know, we haven't done it intentionally. Um, the group, the, the Community Land Trust has done the best job of that in the United States is the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative in Boston where they brought young people in to their organizations from day, from their organization from day one. You know, they created two. They have the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative is the organizing planning side, and then Dudley Neighbors Incorporated is the community land trust side. And they opened their membership to young people. They bring young people in to help them design projects, and they put young people on their board of directors. And if you've ever seen a wonderful film, there are a couple of nice films about uh, Dudley Street. One is Holding Ground, the other is Gaining Ground. And you see some of the kids you see in the first film 
By the time of the second film, they're the executive directors and the leaders of the organization. So I think it's just a matter of intentionality, and I think we're doing some reflection as a network in the United States looking at that. The new executive director of the National Community Land Trust Network called uh, Grounded Solutions Network, uh, Tony Pickett, is an African American from Atlanta, Georgia, and he has as his cause, his commitment, that the community land trusts at the local level, regional level, and national level are gonna be in addressing these questions of diversity, equity, and race. And included in that are young people. So we've just got to be smarter, and we just haven't done enough of it. I don't think it's a matter of so much of, gee, we don't want to relinquish power, because you don't have a lot of power in the community land trust movement. But it is a matter of making room and mentoring, and we don't do enough of that. Thank we just don't. Too many white bald guys like me are uh, leading the movement that we've got to open it up to other folks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, sure. Yeah. Hi. I have a question oh, sorry. of uh, uh, yeah, a different nature. Um, it's more about, so just to make, like, to, I'm wondering, like, in your experience, land trusts have always been instigated by communities, group of people, or has sometimes been instigated by municipalities? Yeah. And so can you tell us a bit more about how communities uh, interact with municipalities and collaborate? And, uh, and that's what mechanisms work. Uh, yeah, well, it's sometimes uh, a marriage of convenience, sometimes it's born in conflict, sometimes it's a partnership. But, you know, almost every community land trust in the 1980s was created from the bottom up. You know, grassroots organizing, you create your nonprofit from scratch, you start learning how to become a developer, all that. Um, as we moved into the, the 90s, we had an increasing number of places where you already had strong community development corporations, you already had strong church groups, strong community development financial institutions, co-ops, and they said, well, you know, maybe we could either become a community land trust or just operate a community land trust under our corporate umbrella. So we went through like the 90s and 2000, 2010, a lot of community land trusts were actually spawned, created by existing nonprofit organizations, either as spin-offs or as internal programs, or in the case of Dudley Street Neighbor Mission in Boston, a subsidiary. We've also had an increasing number of places where community land trusts were actually instigated, initiated, and unfortunately, in some cases, controlled by city governments. And I say unfortunately because it's really hard to get that C and CLT if the city government gives money, mm -hmm. gives land, helps to create the organization, but then doesn't want to let go, mm -hmm. right? Now, the community land trust in Burlington, Vermont, was created in 1984 at the instigation of a, a Bernie Sanders administration when he was mayor. But he was smart enough, and his administration was smart enough to know that if the land trust was going to survive regime change, in City Hall, it had to be created outside of City Hall, and it had to create its own base of political and social support. So the city government still supports the land trust, but it gives money, it gives land, we give a couple seats on the board to the municipal government, but it doesn't control the community land trust. And I think that's a partnership that works. Unfortunately, in some places it doesn't. I mean, City of Chicago, I helped them create a community land trust there a number of years ago. They created their separate nonprofit. They created their three-part board, but it was Chicago. They didn't want to let go of it. So the mayor of the city council will appoint all the seats on the board. Well, that's not exactly the C in CLT. So, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, like, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. He has the microphone. He's, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Edgar Geraldo. I'm a member of the board of directors for the Cooperative de Pedestal and Child Mills. And I'm also on the board of directors for APAPEX, which is a Pedestal for Pedestal Extension. Uh, we want to take uh, certain laws off the circulation from the Canadian Housing Mortgage uh, Association, but it's just that it's very unique in Quebec that I don't think many lots are left under that uh, mandate. Uh, I think there's, to my knowledge, I've only known of one. So that's where we get into a unknown zone of how do we go about to do that if 
all of the Canadian housing mortgage lots were given back to Milton Park, but weren't given back to Copia FC that on that cost. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So our Amphitheology police is ending in 10, 12, and 14 years, and we're just debating on how to go about that. And we've hired a whole bunch of experts, but you're here, so why not just poke? <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid, you know, I don't know enough about the situation or the structure of the mortgages, and it'd be terribly presumptuous of me to, to try to give advice to uh, the folks in, in Canada. But I think your colleague next door. But maybe my colleague could. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, there you go. <laughs> I don't know what my colleague say, says no. <laughs> maybe if you can repeat the question, uh, what, what exactly is the issue? <laughs> On a payé nos hypothèques il y a cinq ans, puis on a fini de payer les autres hypothèques euh, de, depuis deux ans. Là, il nous reste 12, 14 et 10 ans sur les baux amphithéotiques sur les terrains. Et là, ça vient à échéance. Donc là, dans 10, 12 et 14 ans, mais on a 56 appartements, puis on ne sait pas encore qu ce qui va se faire. La Société canadienne d'habitation et de logement n'a pas un mandat de spéculer sur ses propres terrains. Bon, C'est pour ça qu'ils ont créé les coops les années 70 pour justement les sortir de la circulation, mais contrairement à l'habitation à Milton Park qui ont été revendus, nous n'avons pas été revendus. Okay. Mais c'est là qu'on qu fait face à des enjeux de qu'est-ce qu'on fait, est-ce qu'on renouvelle le bail en plus pour 50 ans ou 100 ans, ou on tente de, de racheter les terrains pour justement les sortir de la circulation, comme Milton Park de façon So I, I might just reframe the question so that can so that John can maybe if he has any give an example from a case like that that could have happened in the U.S. So basically, um, what the gentleman is saying is that they have a situation where a large number of buildings are going to be um, the the contract between those buildings and CMHC or a federal organization is ending soon, and now there's a kind of inter you know, interrogation mark as to, you know, what should we do with it? And do you have like any uh, example in the U.S. of moments where a situation like that happened and how, um, you know, this transfer from a public entity to a community entity was orchestrated <laughs> successfully? <laughs> and, and we well, in the United States, we have what we call the expiring use problem, right? Where We didn't put affordability controls on anything in the United States. We put federal money in, we put state money in, we put municipal money in, and whether it was rental housing, co-op housing, or home ownership, we said, you know, 15 years is probably long enough. Or in the case of home ownership, we didn't put any controls at all. So we face constantly this rolling problem in the United States of publicly assisted housing that was created with public dollars that we have to come back 10 years, 20 years, sometimes 30 years down the road and refinance the whole thing. So I don't have, I mean, we are the worst people to look at because we made a mess of the whole thing you know, in the United States. I will say that there's at least consciousness of the problem at the municipal level, but we keep making the same mistake at the federal level. We have something called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, right, where people get a tax break for investing in rental housing. And it only has to remain affordable for 15 years. So 15 years later, we have to refinance the whole darn thing. So we are the worst people to give advice to you. So you're going to figure it out. And when you figure it out, teach us. <laughs> so I'll just say, just see if there's just a couple more questions, and, and, and then we'll close. La last question, the last question. Oui. question. Thank you very much, both of you. It's uh, fascinating. I just want to sort of, when they, they were talking about power of land and uh, ownership down there in the South, my first thoughts were First Nations people who feel such a connection to the land and now have, it's being cut through because they, they, they have no power over it, really, essentially, anymore. And What the chief said is ridiculous. This is an essential good. You couldn't invent a more stupid system for supplying this essential good than capitalism, where we bid against each other for 
a, a limited good, in fact. There's only so much land, it's a limited good. And economists are starting to wake up, they're re-looking at the economics of housing, because they just thought it was like any other good. And it's so stupid that when the cost of it goes down, of housing goes down, it's bad news. You know, all the housing market's gone down. It's like, no, because we're so addicted to this home ownership idea. And that is one of the primary things I think we have to break in society, is this view. We are all paying way too much for housing, even if you own the house. You're paying so much in mortgage to, only people are benefiting are the developers and the banks. The true cost of housing is the construction and the maintenance of the building, and besides the taxes for service, the only other, every other thing is the cause of the system. We should be paying like 20%. You can build a house that lasts for hundreds of years. And the maintenance of it shouldn't be that much. So it's, you've got to look forward to that. But I, I did have a question about financing, because I, I feel like you know government should be able to finance this really at no cost, because over the long term, the rent people pay could pay back on the loan, you know, so it shouldn't really cost governments. But it seems that you, how is your financing model? Because you seem to be doing all sorts of things in Burlington and. Uh, well, uh, yeah. in the early days, you know, we were we were using charitable money. We were using a lot of nuns and uh, priests, the religious orders. We had to borrow money from them because the banks wouldn't touch us. Mm -hmm. But over time, that's part of the proof of concept, where if a bank invests in a land trust and knows because of our record of success that they're not gonna to have to foreclose, that's a good investment. When the public puts money in and they know they're not gonna to have to come back 15 years later and reinvest, that's conservative, fiscally conservative investment. So we've gotten to the point where we still have a lot of opponents, we still have a lot of enemies, we have people look at this and say, oh my God, creeping communism, you guys are gonna socialize all the land. But, you know, we also have a lot of folks who are pretty conservative people, either in the private financial community or public officials who say, you know, this just makes good sense. This is fiscally prudent. Put your money in one time so it stays in, it doesn't get lost, you create an asset that's there forever. That's a good investment. One more story and I'll let you go home, and that is, I worked for a socialist mayor, Bernie Sanders. I was his uh, director of housing. And in the early days, uh, when we started the Community Land Trust, Bernie was skeptical about the whole idea. He looked at it and said, how come the little guy can't make a buck? Because Bernie was into that same mentality, you know, home ownership is so people can make a buck and take some money out of it down the road. Well, the first person to get it, and the first person to support the Community Land Trust in Burlington was a conservative banker on our city council. Actually, he was a lawyer who represented three of the banks in town. And he said, wait a minute, look, I'm a fiscal conservative. We put the money in one time, and we don't have to put it in again. Isn't that what the public investment is supposed to be about? And I'm there, oh, there, I got whiplash here. I got this conservative Republican on the city council who's saying, land trust, land trust. And I got my socialist mayor, who's my boss, <laughs> saying, I don't know about this whole deal. Well, a few years down the road, Bernie looked at it and said, look, people don't lose homes. We invest some money one time. And you know, when they move out, they do get something. They get some return on their investment. They don't get it all. They don't even get most of it. Most of it stays in the house for the next generation. He says, you know, the little guy does pretty well. The little guy is getting most of the sticks in the bundle of rights. All right, I'm behind it. By the time he got to the Congress, he pushed through a piece of legislation when he was in the House of Representatives that created a definition of community land trust. And so we became eligible for a lot of funding under federal law. So, but it took Bernie, my socialist mayor, was slow coming to the table. The conservative banker said, Oh, gee, I don't know. This is the way public money ought to go in. So the politics get strange when you start doing land and housing. Okay. okay. Merci beaucoup, uh, John Davis.
Une grande audience, votre, euh, votre grande patience malgré qui fait chaud maintenant, et aussi pour vos questions pertinentes. Donc, euh, je mets mon petit chapeau de, de missionnaire euh, du, du foncier solidaire. Donc, vous savez que nous organisons euh, d'autres activités, donc le 2 avril, qu'est-ce que l'économie solidaire, ainsi que la fin de semaine du 12, 13 et 14 avril au Centre canadien d'architecture, le contrôle communautaire des terrains, d'habitation et de l'économie. Et j'invite des gens parmi vous qui aimeraient s'impliquer dans l'organisation de ce colloque, de venir nous voir à, 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 tout de suite après. Euh, C'est vraiment un, un très beau défi. On se fait des super contacts intéressants et ça permet à beaucoup de projets de foncier solidaire d'émerger. Euh, je vous rappelle aussi qu'il y a le livre de John Davis, Manuel d'anti-spéculation immobilière en ventre à l'entrée. Ça va, je vous souhaite une bonne fin de soirée et au plaisir de vous revoir. Um, and, and also, if you, um, if you, yeah, if you'd like to make a contribution, um, we have a hat at the table at the back, so you can make a contribution there. Thank you very much.